Okay. Thanks, Andrew, for having me, bringing me. Thanks, Dan, for bringing me up here. And thanks, all of you, for coming on a lovely, beautiful afternoon. So I'm impressed. It's a great turnout. Thank you. And I'll try to be really provocative without being impolite and rude. <laughs> And uh, I hope to talk for maybe 35, 40 minutes uh, and present, uh, and then hopefully that will leave us time for, for discussion and, and throwing of tomatoes. And, um, and so I, I asked Andrew that if, if I'm not done by quarter two, he's going to let me know. Okay? So thank you. Uh, here we go. Let me, uh, let me start off with two stories. Um, a few years ago, Six or seven years ago, my best friend, Ami is his name. Ami loves Jamaica. He spent many years there. He taught high school in Jamaica 30 years ago. And since then, he's been back many times. He did two Fulbrights there. Uh, he's lived many years in Jamaica. It's his happy place. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, close uh, friends and relations there. Um, about six or seven years ago, my best friend, Ami, was down there in Jamaica. He was uh, in Port Antonio, went out for a hangout at a, a local uh, bar there, and this woman kept saying to him, you know, hey, buy me a beer, and Ami knew that you don't do that, and he said no, and she kept saying, oh, hey, man, buy me a beer, buy me a red stripe, and Ami kept saying no, 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 and after about an hour of this, she kept pestering him, come on, man, buy me a red stripe. He finally said, fine. He bought, and he said, uh, here, uh, can I get a red stripe? And, and just as he was buying the beer for this woman, her boyfriend entered the bar, um, saw Ami buying a beer for his girlfriend, took out a knife, and stabbed Ami in the back right here, going for a major organ, trying to kill him. Uh, it didn't hit the major organ, but there was the knife, blood spurted everywhere. The rest of the bar attacked Ami's assailant with metal chairs, intending to kill the assailant. Uh, Ami, in fact, was the one that stopped them from killing him, said, come on, don't kill the guy, don't kill the guy. So there was Ami with his knife in his back, this guy's bleeding on the ground. Uh, it's Jamaica, no 911. So what do you do? You try to get an ambulance. No ambulances around uh, Port Antonio were available at that particular time. Nobody in the bar owned a car. Finally, somebody knew somebody who had a car, and after a while, they finally got Ami to a hospital. Finally got him in to see a doctor. Got the knife removed. Fortunately, it hadn't hit anything vital. And the doctor said, uh, sir, you're going to need stitches. And Ami said, OK. And the doctor said, uh, no, you don't understand. You're going you're gonna to need stitches for that wound. And Ami said, OK. And the doctor said, you're not understanding me. You need stitches. And Ami said, OK, do it. And the doctor said, we don't have stitches here. We're out of suture supplies. This is the hospital. <laughs> he ended up just putting some duct tape on it. And he was OK. Got a pretty interesting scar. And all is well. He hates it when I tell this uh, story, by the way. He loves Jamaica so much, and he's Got so many, uh, had so many great experiences there. So he doesn't want you to think that this is his, you know, please don't reduce Jamaica to this one incident. That same year, I was living in Denmark with my family in university housing, and my mother in law came to visit. She was in her 60s at the time, and she was my older daughter, who then wasn't very old, was seven or eight got her, wanted to play some kind of game with her, like a blind man's bluff game. She was going to lead her down some stairs. Not such a good idea. My mother-in-law lost her footing and fell down a particularly hard flight of stairs. Was immediately whisked to the closest, very close hospital. They took such great care of her from top to bottom. They looked her over. They gave her anti-inflammatories and pain medication. And they checked this and they checked that. And they x-rayed this and they x-rayed that. And they gave her this kind of pain pill and this kind of medication. And they talked to her and consulted with her. Excellent care, all free. Scandinavia has uh, uh, all free tax-subsidized health care, including for visiting mother-in-laws. So here we've got my best friend, my mother-in-law, both sustaining injuries, both sustaining injuries the same year in two very different parts of the world. Why am I starting with these stories? Okay. These two anecdotes illustrate just how different Jamaica and Denmark 
are in many ways, in many ways. Um, for starters, Jamaica is one of the most violent societies in the world. So even though that particular incident that my friend experienced, I don't want to reduce Jamaica to that, it actually is part of a larger macro situation here. Well, Denmark happens to be one of the least violent societies in the world. And just let me give you the statistics. For example, the current murder rate in Jamaica is 52 murders per 100,000. That's how we do murder rates, right? Per 100,000. The murder rate in Denmark is less than one per 100,000. So the murder rate in Jamaica is 50, over 50 times higher than in Denmark. And let's just be clear, uh, and, and populations are, you know, Jamaica is about 2.8 million, Denmark's about 5.5 million, so these are both small societies, almost totally, both surrounded by water, Jamaica totally, Denmark almost. Um, and while healthcare, as my friend experienced, is, is substandard in Jamaica, Danes enjoy, as my mother-in-law experienced, one of the best healthcare systems, most well-functioning public healthcare systems on Earth, which helps explain why when the United Nations does their human development index, Denmark is very high in terms of human development, Jamaica, unfortunately, quite low. Now, there are obviously a lot of differences between these two societies. I've been to both of them. Uh, uh, there are economic differences, cultural differences, geographic differences, demographic differences, political differences, culinary differences, and the distinct history of Jamaica as a brutal, bloody stop in the transatlantic slave trade bears significant stressing. The original inhabitants of Jamaica were the Arawak Indians. They were exterminated en masse by the Spanish, and then enslaved Africans were brought to Jamaica, sometimes as a way station, sometimes kept there, producing rum under horrific, bloody, violent conditions. So there was a bloody, violent history in Jamaica brought by Europeans that uh, uh, is very important. So while Jamaica was on the losing end of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, Denmark, of course, was on the benefiting end. Denmark was never a colonial power, never a slave uh, uh, a nation, slave-owning or slave-running nation, and yet benefiting from that, for sure. So there's a lot of differences, but the one difference I want to stress as I start today's lecture is this issue of religiosity or secularity. The fact is, most Jamaicans are very, very religious. Most Danes are very, very secular. Most Jamaicans pray a lot, most Danes don't. Most Jamaicans go to church regularly, most Danes don't. In fact, Danes have the lowest rate of church attendance in the world. Most Jamaicans place a significant amount of importance on faith in God, most Danes don't. In fact, Danes place the least significance of God of any population on earth. Most Jamaicans believe that the Bible is the word of God. Most Danes consider the Bible a book of nice stories. Most Jamaicans believe in heaven and hell. Most Danes don't. In fact, Danes have the lowest rates of belief in heaven and hell on earth. Most Jamaicans love Jesus a lot. Most Danes like Jesus, <laughs> think he was a nice guy, love Jesus, that's a bit much for your average Dane. Okay, so on just about every indicator you can think of, belief, behavior, and belonging, Jamaicans are on the very religious end of the spectrum, Danes are on the least religious or more secular end of the spectrum. Why am I focusing on Jamaica and Denmark? I mean, these are random countries, small populations, what's the deal? But what I would argue tonight, or this afternoon rather, is that actually these are just stand-ins, right? These are, J Jamaica is just, can readily stir, serve as a stand-in for many nations across the planet in similar sociological straits. Poor, struggling, vulnerable, violent, nations like Haiti, El Salvador, Colombia, Liberia, Zimbabwe, or the Philippines, right? And Denmark is really a stand-in representing many other nations on this planet today that are developed nations enjoying high levels of prosperity and peacefulness. Nations like Norway, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, Canada, or Australia. And when we compare these two types of nations, right, we see that the secularity and religiosity correlation is really strong. In fact, 
The poorer, more chaotic, more troubled countries on earth today are among the most religious, while the wealthier, more stable, more well-functioning, peaceful countries are among the most secular. And this is not the way it's supposed to work, at least according to the billboards I saw driving up Highway 99 today. <laughs> According to most conservative religious folks, be they Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or whatnot, um, religion is supposed to be good and beneficial for society, and the absence of religion is supposed to be really bad and harmful. In other words, strongly religious countries like Jamaica should be faring really well. I mean, they are praising God a lot. He should be very really happy with all this praise, and he should be blessing them. And countries that ignore God should be in... Troubled situations. They should be suffering for their lack of piety. But when we actually look around the world, we see something very different. So let's look at this uh, uh, issue here. There's uh, yet another embarrassment to my people, Dennis Prager. Um, really uh, well-known talk radio host and best-selling author. Uh, recently wrote a, a, a piece here in a newspaper in LA. No society, no God, no moral society. I'm sure you've heard this many times, right? In today's America, in our political culture right now, this declaration is widely assumed to be true. That, you know, we have to have God to have a moral, sound, well-functioning society. Consider Newt Gingrich, right, as a stand-in for a sort of one of the more prominent Republicans in our country today, a former congressional leader, presidential candidate, best-selling author, repeatedly arguing that religion is good and necessary for societal well-being and that the absence of religion is horrible, scary, bad. For example, back in 2011, he said any country that ignores God or attempts to drive God out of public life will face all kinds of social problems and will frankly be a nightmare. In his book, Rediscovering God in America, he characterized secularism as a ruthless, destructive force. And in 2010, in his more recent book, he described secularism as, as dangerous to America as Nazism. In the aftermath of the massacre of school children in Newton, Connecticut, he publicly proclaimed that such violence was the obvious and inevitable consequence of secularism in our society. This is nothing new. I mean, you find such declarations in the Bible, right? The, pro the, the Jeremiah and Isaiah are always saying, you know, well, of course you're suffering from the plague. You, you're ignoring God. Or, of course, there, you were defeated in war. You ignored God. I mean, so this goes way back. But even, uh, we can even look to these pillars of, of, of Western civilization here. Voltaire, a leading Enlightenment fit figure, celebrated Enlightenment philosopher, very critical of religion, yet still argued that it's necessary for people to have profoundly engraved on their minds the idea of a supreme being and creator in order to maintain a moral social order. Uh, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, in his classic Democracy in America, argued that faith is indispensable for a well-functioning society, that irreligion is a dangerous and pernicious threat, and that non-believers are to be regarded as natural enemies of social harmony. It's so weird being a natural enemy of social harmony, but it kind of feels good. Anyway, um, we get this uh, all the time. Um, Edmund Burke, of course, in his classic Reflections on the French Revolution, argued that religion was absolutely the underlying basis of any successful civil social order. All the way up to our great philosophers of the day. <laughs> leading, uh, leading the pack. So I just, you just have to understand why I have, why I'm grinding my axe here because it's in my face all the time. I'm constantly being told from classic, you know, from Enlightenment philosophers up to the to the radio that secularism is somehow dangerous. It's a danger, and without God, society will fall apart. It's immoral. Bill O'Reilly arguing all the time that religion is necessary for a good society, and without it, society will become anarchic, chaotic, weak, and lawless. Uh, uh, Tammy Bruce argued that without Christianity, uh, uh, society will be vague, empty, and lost. Um, I have to just give this one final example because it hit me in the face when I was at my in-laws a couple of Christmases ago. Um, my in-laws don't have any books in their home, but they do have a computer, so I was going to CNN.com on uh, Christmas morning, 
and there was, on the front page of CNN, was this piece by uh, Alex Taunton from the uh, uh, Fixed Point Foundation, and the argument of this front page CNN uh, post was that, referencing It's a Wonderful Life, right, saying that societies that are Christian resemble um, Bedford Falls. You know, peaceful, sweet, everybody helps each other out, polite, genteel, nice, uh, moral, and when religion goes away, when Christianity goes away, society will become like Pottersville, harsh, greedy, chaotic, degraded, ugly, not nice. Well, I like this kind of stuff. I'm a sociologist. We've got an independent variable and a dependent variable. Okay, you're saying that if there's a society that's very religious and believes in God, it will be good, and if it doesn't, it will be bad. Well, let's look. Let's look at the data. What we find is that there is no support for this assertion, this thousand-year-old assertion that keeps getting blasted. In fact, it's actually among the more secular societies on Earth that we find the greatest levels of social harmony, civility, freedom, equality, peacefulness, prosperity, and it's among the most religious, the most God-loving, the most God-worshipping societies that we find the highest levels of destitution, chaos, insecurity, inequality, oppression, immorality, and poverty. The truth is, the highly secularized Denmarks of the world are very much like Bedford Falls, and the highly religious, God-loving societies on Earth today, are the Jamaicas of the world, are much closer to um, Pottersville. <sighs> now, before proceeding, let me make one thing clear. I don't think the Denmarks of the world are doing so well solely because they are very secular. What a, what a ridiculously reductionist assertion. I don't think the Jamaicans of the world are, doing, are struggling so solely because they're highly religious. I am not here blaming Jamaica's problems on their strong religiosity, nor am I attributing Denmark's healthy success solely to its secularity. Such a view would be so simplistic. And furthermore, I'm sure you've already come to this on your own, the obvious case could be made that it's the other way around. When societies become prosperous and peaceful, the need for religion goes down. When societies are struggling and chaotic and poor and weak, then the need for religion goes up. But either way, the results, the situation in the world today still flies in the face of those who would say, we need religion in order to have a good society, and without religion, society will be destroyed. That we can clearly see as false, and we can and, and prove it wrong. Let's, uh, so let's do this. Let's, do our, let's check out our independent variable. Let's look at the most God-loving countries and the least God-loving countries. And fortunately, we've got a lot of international data on that. So what do we see? These countries here represent the most religious countries in the world in terms of God belief and several other indicators. Nigeria, Uganda, Philippines, Pakistan, Morocco, Egypt, Zimbabwe, Bangladesh, El Salvador, Colombia, Senegal, Malawi, Indonesia, Brazil, Peru, Jordan, Algeria, Ghana, Venezuela, Mexico, Sierra Leone. There's many more I can put up here that are just as religious, probably 70 other countries, but these represent those that in survey after survey after survey appear to be the most theistic countries on earth. As for the least theistic, the most agnostic or atheistic or, lead or most secular, what do we got? Sweden, Denmark, Czech Republic, Japan, Canada, Norway, Finland, China, New Zealand, South Korea, Estonia, France, Vietnam, Russia, Bulgaria, Netherlands, Slovenia, Germany, Hungary, Great Britain, Australia, and Belgium. We could throw a few others up there, but these are the core secular countries according to, to um, most international surveys. So what do we find? Which set of countries is doing the best? According to Newt Gingrich and Fox News, it should be the most religious. And the least religious should be in terrible straits, but we see just the opposite. The most religious are the worst off, and the most secular are the best off. Let's consider some specific examples. How about motherhood? I I'm picking motherhood because, I mean, that's something almost everybody can agree is an important thing. Certainly religious people think it's an important thing. You know, mothers. Mothers. Gotta love mothers. Okay. Well, there's an organization, Save the Children, which puts out an annual 
Mother's Index, every year, looking at what countries on Earth are the best or worst for mothers. And they have multiple variables they look at. You know, uh, you know, from infant mortality rates to, to child safety to uh, prenatal care to how many people are in attendance during births to what kind of uh, play facilities there are to giving birth, all the things that you might uh, would, would think about that would consider that you would consider trying to see if this is a good society for mothers. And what do we find year after year after year? Those countries that are the best places on earth for mothers are the most highly secular societies on earth. And those societies that are the worst places to give birth and the worst places on this are the most religious. What's another thing religious people claim to like? Peace. <laughs> Christianity's big on peace and nonviolence. Islam's big on peace. Judaism is, I guess, big on peace. <coughs> what do we all right? Peace. Jesus teaches peace. The prophets teach peace. Well, where is peace most likely to occur? We've got the Global Peace Index. They take into account about 40 variables, from, from, from warfare, to murder rates, to access to firearms, to number of people in prisons, to conflict, to assault, all the kind of things you might look at to determine whether society is peaceful or not. And what do we find? The most peaceful societies on Earth are the most secular, more or less. And the, most, and the places where peace is least likely to occur tend to be among the more religious. Not absolute, but they tend to be. Let's just take one more, because everybody, everybody can agree that murder is something that's not really good in a society. If there's any one single widely agreed upon pathological element to have in a society, it's homicide. So what countries have the highest murder rates? Among the most religious. And what countries have the, the Colombia, Mexico, El Salvador, Brazil, these are all Christ-centered societies, and they have the highest murder rates. Where do we see the lowest levels of homicide? Sweden, Japan, Norway, and the Netherlands, among the least Christian societies on Earth. Japan, truly among the least Christian societies ever, ever seen, yet among the lowest rates of murder in the world, or in the history of the world. This correlation holds true on indicator after indicator after indicator after indicator. You can look at so many things from quality of roads and highways to freedom of speech and freedom of the press and we find the correlation holds again and again and again. The more secular are faring better. There's one important exception which I'm happy to talk about and that's suicide. Suicide rates are actually lower among more religious societies and higher among more secular societies. And I can explain why we think that is the case. But other than that, important outlier, the, the situation holds true. But wait a minute, Phil. Come on. Comparing countries, that's tough. I mean, Japan's so different from El Salvador. There's too many different. I mean, can you really compare demographically, historically, culturally? They're so different. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if we could look at one country, like this is one country that, I don't know, was like divided into little segments, and you know, compare within the same country, so we're not dealing with this, uh, oh, let's look at our own. We've got 50 states and we've got awesome data that tells us what states are the most religious in terms of church attendance, God belief, love of Jesus, love of the Bible, and which are the most secular. Does the correlation hold true? in the 8th greatest country in the world? Yes, it does. The most theistic states in America, Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Taiwan, Utah. The lowest, the least theistic states in America, Maine, Vermont, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, Alaska, Oregon, and California. Now, it's important to remember it's not that one group is totally theistic and the other group is totally atheistic. There are still a majority of God believers in every state in America, yet God belief is far lower in the, in the lower states that, than in the higher states, right? And what do we find? As expected, when it comes to nearly every measure of societal health, from homicide rates to violent crime rates to poverty rates to domestic abuse rates, obesity rates, educational attainment, STD, oh, by the way, happy sexually transmitted Infection Awareness Month. I read that in the bathroom stall. Okay, and, and I, did, I did find it interesting that the number one way to prevent STIs is abstinence. <laughs> what planet are we on? Anyway, um, 
so strange in 2014 to see abstinence promulgated as the number one way to avoid STIs. Anyway, um, at the very bottom it said, oh, you might want to use condoms. Okay, anyway, uh, so what do we find? In survey after survey, study after study, the most God-loving states in this country are fearing the worst. And the most God-ignoring or agnostic or atheistic or secular states are doing the best. Heck, we can simply look at, how about this one? Rates of child abuse fatalities. That's a great indicator, right? These are kids killed by their own caretakers. Their parents, grandparents, uncles, or foster care parents, or adopted. Kids killed, right? What do we find? The rates of kids being beaten to death by their own parents are markedly higher in the most Christian states in America and far lower in the most secular states in America. In fact, the child abuse fatality rate in Mississippi is twice that of New Hampshire's. The child abuse fatality rate in Kentucky is four times that of Oregon. How is it that we equate religiosity with morality? What's going on? What is happening? We'll get to that. I hope. All right. Let's consider some critiques. I know you have them. And I'm going to try and head them off of the pass. You see what I'm doing here. So let's, let's consider, let's, let's, I'll now turn it on and see, uh, see what I can say here. There are a lot of critiques I get from this, from this stuff. The most obvious one is that correlation does not equal causation, right? We know this. Did you know that shoe size is correlated with educational attainment? It's true. Shoe size, the higher your shoe size, the more likely you are to attain uh, more education. Isn't that true? It is true. It's absolutely true. Why? Why would shoe size be 100% correlated with educational attainment? Right now. Yeah, it's age causes both. Age causes shoe sizes to increase and educational attainment to achieve, right? So just because two things look like they might be related, they could be being caused by some third variable. The correlation, the relationship could be spurious. So as a good sociology student, I know one or two of you are here. I can feel the vibe. Uh, you should know that correlation is not causation. So just because the most successful, peaceful, and prosperous societies tend to be secular, that does not mean, as I already indicated, that it's a secularity that's causing it. And just because the most uh, messed up, crime-ridden, poor countries on earth today are religious doesn't mean it's because of their religiosity. These things may be related, they may not. And that is really, really important to remember. In fact, if I had to place my kids' heads on a bet, I would say, indeed, it's probably one cause and the other. It's probably more likely that when societies are successful and democratic and peaceful and prosperous, as I've already said, they then become more secular. And when societies are suffering from inequality and poverty and warfare and, 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 and chaos, that they tend to be more religious. And you could understand the psychological and sociological reasons as why that might be the case. However, however, I am not willing to go to the place where I think it's totally epiphenomenal. I don't think secularity and religiosity are totally derivative. I don't think they're just exhaust fumes. I would argue that there are some aspects to secularism that in fact promote societal well-being, that aren't just the result of it, but actually part of the driving engine that creates stable societies and healthy economies and good, well-functioning <laughs> cultures. Why do I say that? Secularism, we could understand as a conscious, non-spiritual, rational ideology for social betterment in the here and now. And I would argue it has been a key ingredient, not the only one, but I'm also not willing to just toss it aside as every phenomenon. Let me give you some examples. Democracy is a huge requirement for a successful civil society, and we see that the most successful societies today tend to be democracies. Well, that shift from theocracy to democracy is secularism in a big sense. Those who wanted to establish government by the consent of the governed had the notion of separation of truth and state. That was one of the first things that had to happen. We've got to get the, the, the pope is no longer going to be the head of state. 
The religious authorities, uh, are, the clerics, are not going to be running the show of the government. We have to have a secular government. That is Jeffersonian secularism right there. So in that sense, there's one example. Just the shift to democracy, secularism is part of that shift. How about another one? Women's rights. Wherever secularism advances, so too do women's rights. Even in not so nice places like the Soviet Union. Women's rights was high on the agenda. A lot of other ugly things were too. But we see this correlation very strongly, so much so that I don't even think it's a correlation. There's something very interesting about secular ideology that seems to always improve the situation for women. In fact, wherever secularism is strong, women's rights improve. And wherever religiosity is strong, women's rights plummet. Look at what happened in Iran after the revolution. Look what happened in Afghanistan once the Taliban took over. Where do we see uh, uh, this all over the world? We see this all over the world. I will give another example. Um, the fight against, against caste in India. India is the second most populated country in the world. This is a huge chunk of humanity. Shackled by this religio-cultural hierarchy of caste. A heinous uh, uh, structure inequality. Who is at the forefront of fighting against caste? Secular Indians. Secularist Indians. So the movement to democracy has secular, uh, secularism as part of that movement. The movement for women's rights, secularism is part of that movement. The fight against caste in India, greater rights for gays and lesbians, secularism is part of that. Heck, the development of same-sex ed. You can thank secular feminist activists for that as well. So I would argue that there's a lot going on here. The development of the welfare state in Scandinavia was spearheaded by consciously secular activists. Scandinavia was among the poorest regions of Europe 150, 200 years ago. People were starving to death and freezing to death in the streets. Tens of thousands, a third of Sweden left. It was so uh, awful there. Tremendous inequality, widespread poverty, and yet within two or three or four generations they became the most wealthy countries in the world and the most egalitarian, so they share their wealth. That was spearheaded by the Social Democratic Party, which was actively anti-clerical. Consciously secular. Consciously secular. Another criticism of my talk. Wait a minute, Phil. You, how can you talk about secularism and not mention these heinously atheistic regimes? Let's talk about them. Absolutely. No question. Some of the worst, heinous, most genocidal, oppressive regimes of the 20th century were atheistic. Absolutely. And any secularist that wants to sidestep that, or sugarcoat that, or whitewash that, is, is not my kind of secularist. <laughs> we have to absolutely acknowledge that uh, uh, nations like the former Soviet Union under Stalin, Cambodia under Pol Pot, um, Albania under Enver Hoxha, these were uh, anti-religious regimes, and their societies were anything but good. They were oppressive and repressive and unjust. So there's no question that totalitarianism plus atheism seems to make for a really ugly mix. Ah, absolutely, the 20th century teaches us that. But is atheism the problem, or is totalitarianism the problem? Let's look at the 20th century. We know that a lot of corrupt regimes have been extremely religious in nature. Uganda under Idi Amin, Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe, Haiti under Baby Doc Duvalier, Chile under Augusto Pinochet, Iran under the Ayatollahs, Spain under Franco, the Philippines under Marcos. In fact, the apartheid regime in South Africa was bolstered by the church. Bolstered by the church. And heck, I know I shouldn't do this because Professor Katie once told me that whoever brings out Adolf Hitler in a debate is, a, is the one that lost the debate. Uh, so sorry to go there. But we can even look at that poster boy of, of evil, Adolf Hitler, a Catholic individual, raised in the Catholic Church, never excommunicated from the Catholic Church, repeatedly declared himself a Christian, believed Jesus as his savior, couched his genocidal goals in distinctly religious theistic terms. In fact, the very loyalty oath in the Nazi party for all Nazi officers, soldiers, and each civil servants begin, began with the words, I swear by God, and then they pledged their allegiance to Hitler and the Nazi state. But 
let's not get into a meandering, macabre discussion of who killed more people, uh, uh, you know, theistic dictators or atheistic dictators. The bottom line is all, all non-democratically elected regimes of the past century have been corrupt. Fascism, totalitarianism, communism, all such modern forms of political dominance have been based on might and repression rather than freedom and liberty. They've all squelched societal progress and they all uh, deserve to be condemned. So what move can we make? Oh, how about this one? We know that religion comes in all shapes and sizes. We know there's fanatical religion and progressive religion and fundamentalist religion and liberal religion. And we know there's people that blow themselves up in the name of religion and there are people that man staff soup kitchens in the name of religion. We know that religions are behind you know, warfare and also create orphanages. So we know that religion, there's good, there's bad, and everything in between. Let's apply that same standard to seculars. I would argue that we can make a clear distinction between societies in which atheism or secularism is imposed by a coercive regime, a dictatorship, totalitarian regime on top, forced on a captive population, as was the case in the Soviet Union, and in Albania, and, and in Cambodia, China, or we can talk about organic secularity. And by that I mean democratic societies where the people themselves simply turn away from religion. It's not being forced at the barrel of a gun. They're not being threatened with prison or torture. They just simply opt out, lose interest, stop going to church, stop believing. It's those organically secular societies that we see the greatest levels of societal health. And it's, of course, among the repressive or coercive or poor of these societies that we see uh, uh, the disasters. So even if we admit and acknowledge that correlation is not causation. And even when we acknowledge that some of the worst societies of the past century have been led by atheist tyrants, as well as religious tyrants, we are still left with the undeniable reality today that when we compare nations as well as states within nations, and we can even go to the county level if you want, the more secular are faring qualitatively and quantitatively better than the more religious, which are faring worse on just about every indicator uh, of societal goodness imaginable. It may not be because they are religious, but their religiosity is clearly no panacea, to be sure. But I'm going to end here. I actually think, and again, a strong case can be made that secularism in and of itself is an important factor here. It's not just derivative. It's not just an outcome. It itself has wonderful potential that I think we are seeing. What are some of those aspects of the secular life? Well, I don't know how to say this, I'm sure there's a word for it in German, but like a here and nowness. When you are secular, this is it. This time, this world, this life, it's all we get. There's no heaven, there's no reincarnation, there's no hell, this is it. And what I find in my research is that does not reduce secular people to becoming apathetic nihilists. It actually forces them to try and make their lives and this world a better place. This is all we get. I'm working to make this society better for myself and my children in the hopes that it will be more peaceful for everyone. And that's that. And I think this real world here and nowness translates into social betterment. There is, of course, a great deal of self-reliance in being secular, or at least, if not self-reliance, reliance on, on others, friends and family. When we get breast cancer, when we lose a loved one, when we are in the midst of warfare, we don't have anybody to pray to. There's no avatars, there's no prophets, there's no gods, it's just us. And this creates a certain type of mentality and orientation of the world that, again, I think, at the macro level, nets positive benefits. We're empiricists, by and large. By that means we take into account things like facts and data and statistics. Not that those things are perfect or flawless, but it's all we got. We don't rely on faith, we don't rely on prayer, we don't rely on tarot cards. We, we rely on the, an empirical reality to make our, our lives better. And that includes problem solving. When we see crime, we don't turn to prayer. We try to figure out what causes crime and how can we prevent it. When we see poverty and hunger, we don't turn to prayer. We try to figure out how can we solve these, these problems. So there's a, an approach that's based on study and analysis and not faith. And, and again, it seems to bear fruit. 
I've lived in Denmark for two years, and I've seen the fruit it bears. Scientific inquiry. I hate to say it, but <laughs> have you seen those clips on YouTube of people who can finally hear for the first time? And I don't mean to like get on my soapbox here, but they've developed these cochlear implants that are allowing deaf people to hear for the first time in their life. Do you know how long humans have been praying to cure deafness? Do you know how long those prayers have gone unanswered? And yet now with scientific uh, investigations, people are able to hear again. I don't mean to pit science against religion. I'm sure the person invented cochlear implants prayed all the time, whatever. But the point <laughs> here is that science can uh, benefit humanity in many, many ways. Skepticism towards authority and tradition is a hallmark, character trait of secular individuals. And I think that's healthy for a democracy. Independence of thought, ethics based on the golden rule. So for secular cult in secular culture, uh, ethics and morals are not a laundry list of do's and don'ts proclaimed by a sky deity, but ethics and morality really is reduced to treating people the way you want to be treated. It's kind of simple, it's basic, based on empathetic reciprocity. It seems to work well in these highly secular societies. I mean, isn't it interesting that the most secular societies on earth are the ones to outlaw the death penalty, and yet here in Christian America, we still have the death penalty, and in fact, evangelical Christians are the most supportive of the death penalty of any demographic group besides Mormons in the United States? The death penalty. The very, the very thing their savior was suffered from. Fascinating. And who's the most against the death penalty in the United States? Atheists. And finally, uh, uh, the way secular people tend to raise their kids, where these values are, are at the forefront, I believe produces uh, positive societal benefits. And I think we'll end there. I saw some hands already, so thanks for listening. Nobody walked out, so that's my first, I did all right. Uh, now, now I'm ready for the attack. Bring it on. Um, should I just call it? Yeah,